This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Ramika Vincent Leary and welcome to this edition of In Studio. Have you ever wondered what it takes to become an Olympian? Hard work and dedication are part of the equation, but those elements just scratch the surface. Each athlete has an individual journey, one that is often ripe with many challenges. Now it's interesting to note Pensacola, Florida is home to several Olympians from the 20th and 21st centuries. Tonight we'll explore the lives of some of these amazing men and women from preparation to the games to the present. Get ready to root for our local heroes because we're going for the gold during this edition of In Studio. Welcome back, everyone. Let the adrenaline rush begin as we highlight Olympians among us. From weightlifting to swimming to track and field, we have you covered. With the Summer Games in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil approaching, we'll also highlight one athlete who is competing in August. But first, I'm honored to introduce 1948 Olympic gold medalist Frank Spellman. He competed in weightlifting and still enjoys a fervent love of the sport today. Welcome to the show, Frank. Thank you. How are you doing? Wonderful. All right, I'm wonderful in your presence as well. Frank, <laughs> I had a chance to visit you before we actually decided to do this show. You told me an interesting story that you were raised in an orphanage in yes. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Let's talk about that first. What time when I was seven, my father died, and my mother was left with five children. And during that time, jobs were all not available. So the best thing was for my sister and I, the, we were the two youngest, to be put in an orphan home. And I was in the orphan home for 10 years, from the time I was seven till I was 17. While in there, uh, I was doing gymnastics, doing painting, playing music. Uh, they uh, let, allowed us to pursue things that we'd like to do. So uh, it was good for me. That's a compelling story <laughs> because a lot of people hear stories about a life in an orphanage and they may feel that those amenities would not be available, but in your case, it was different. So from that experience in the orphanage, did anything make you think about the sport of weightlifting, was there anything that provided a segue toward that? No. I was a gymnast, and uh, at the time I was 17, uh, a fellow came in the gym, and uh, he asked me if I could show him some uh, tricks on some of the uh, apparatus, uh, and I did. And uh, I noticed that he had a wonderful physique. And I asked him, you know, what you did to did get a physique like that. And uh, he said, weightlifting. And I said, what's weightlifting? <laughs> and he said, well, can you come to the house after school and I'll show you. And he did. And he put on 100 pounds on the bar and showed me how to lift it, and I lifted it, and he was surprised. That very day? That very day. And then I tried 110, I tried 120, and I did 130, which uh, was uh, unusual, very, very unusual. Very unusual. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't weigh more than uh, somewhere between 110 and 120, so uh, there's very few people uh, capable of doing that, uh, so it kind of bit me. And, uh, that bug, that yeah, weightlifting so bug. When I got out of the orphanage, <clears throat> I joined a gym, a weightlifting gym, and fortunately the people that ran the gym saw uh, something in me and they started coaching me, and in short order I started uh, doing very well. I started competing all around the city, and uh, then in 1942, 
in Bristol, Connecticut, I won the Junior Nationals. That is such an amazing story. So the fact that you had these people, I'm going to call them little angels, placed in your life, and they contributed toward your journey. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the road preceding the 1948 Olympics. We know that a lot of preparation was involved with that, right? Can you tell us what you did? Well, I was in the service from 1942 to 1945. While in the service, I was responsible for the base gymnasium. I spent two years overseas, and while overseas, uh, I had a chance to work out a little bit. And before the invasion of France, why, uh, they asked me if I would compete against the British middleweight champion. So I trained for that, and uh, I did very well. Uh, then when I got out of the service, uh, I called the Olympic coach and he said, Frank, uh, why don't you come to York, Pennsylvania and be on our team? And I thought, wow, a chance in a lifetime. They keep stacking up, don't they? Oh, yes. So let's talk about the 1946 World Championship in Paris, France. And we have so many pictures that we're going to be sharing. That's the the team. That's the team, yes. Uh, there's another fellow, John Turpak, who's standing next to me uh, to my right. Uh, he was the uh, American middleweight champion for ser several years. And in 1946, at the national championships, I beat him. And I was the national champion in 46. So because of that, uh, I was sent for the World Championships in Paris that year, and I placed third in the World Championships. Wow, and we have a picture up right now, and I'm looking. That's, yeah. That's, How many pounds was that? I weighed 156 then, and that was 319. 319 <laughs> pounds, yeah. amazing. And a lot of people, may not understand how a person that doesn't weigh 319 pounds can lift 319 pounds. Would you care to maybe explain that a little bit for our viewers? Well, in training, you train for speed, coordination, explosive power, and the strength comes along with it. Uh, you build up ligament and tendon strength and muscle power. So the combination of those things, why, uh, I was able to achieve what I did. <laughs> All right, so 1947 championship. Look at that picture that we have up right there. Yeah, I now, pl placed second in the world championships that year. Things are a little different nowadays, aren't they? Because when you won your Olympic gold medal in weightlifting in 1948, your team during that time, we know Jim Crow and segregation, that your team, as far as weightlifters were concerned, weren't they integrated? Yes, they were uh, Japanese Hawaiian, Chinese Hawaiian. There was uh, one black fellow, uh, Polish. Uh, my people originally came from Germany. So, and the other middleweight was Ukrainian descent. So <clears throat> it was amazing that all these different folks right. got Cultures. together and were capable of achieving uh, championship caliber lifting, and uh, we all made a team. Out of a possible six gold medals for six different body weights, the Americans won four Olympic gold medals. Speaking of your Olympic gold medal in 1948, we do have some wonderful pictures of you. How much weight did you lift to obtain that gold medal in 1948? Well, uh, there were three different lifts, and you were allowed three attempts at each lift, and the highest were totaled together. That particular Right uh, there. Lift is called a two-arm snatch, Okay. and that was 264, and I weighed 161, 
when I did that. And that, that lift, one was 336. That was my winning lift. That was a wonderful. new Olympic record. That is awesome. You have such a colorful life, Frank. Now, I know that you competed for about 19 years or so. Is that right? Yes. Now, you ran into a lot of interesting people along the way. You knew Jesse Owens. Yes. Famous U.S. Olympic sprinter who competed in the 1936 Olympics, won four gold medals there. How did you know him? In 1979, <clears throat> uh, they had asked uh, the gold medal winners to go to Dallas that year and see if we could raise funds for the uh, 80 Olympics, which we did. And uh, Jesse and I were picked to give a speech and uh, make a record uh, to allow youngsters to become more interested in Olympic activities. So uh, we had gotten together and we became friendly and uh, talked a lot to each other. And, uh, Wonderful. It was a great time for me. You also knew fitness guru and exercise maven, wonderful guy, <clears throat> Jack LaLanne. Yes. So talk about Jack for a moment. Well, Jack and I used to do tumbling and hand balancing together in California. And uh, he was just a wonderful guy, just super. And uh, he helped start what is now known as Muscle Beach. That was back We've in 1939. What about Jock Boxing, rather, and Joe Frazier? Uh, I was a group with a group of people that were honored uh, in Atlanta for the uh, tryouts for the 2012 Olympics. And Joe Frazier was amongst one of the honorees, and Bruce Jenner, and uh, there was a fellow by the name of Smith who's a jiu-jitsu expert, and there was a, a wrestler and two lady uh, jujitsu experts, Olympians. And so we were all sitting around the table and that's when they came the, up. The great introduction. Yeah, uh, Bruce <clears throat> wanted to know how many children that uh, Joe had. Joe said 10 and uh, Bruce said, huh. <laughs> How many did he He's have? He said, I have 11. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah. Let's so, talk so I know Bruce when he was a man. And rightly so. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about what you are doing now, Frank. I visited your home. I walked in the front door and I said, lovely home. And your answer was, Thank I you. built this house. Amazing. I look on the wall, see beautiful paintings. Frank painted those. You are a man of so many talents, and so Thank humble, you. by the way. You really are. Such a joy to know you. And that beautiful painting right there, was that a gift, the one that we see up there on the monitor? Yes, uh, another artist painted that of me. <clears throat> but I've been painting since I've been, the uh, first time I can remember sketching in the sand, I must have been two or three years old. And, uh, and then when I got in the orphan home, uh, one of the first things they said when they ushered me in to the large uh, area room for uh, band playing, they said, every child has to learn to play a musical instrument. Which do you prefer? And of course, being seven years old and being a tiny guy, I saw the drums and I said, those. <laughs> <laughs> and look at all those medals to boot. You still work out three times per week. I do. You get plenty of sunshine, don't you? There's I, no stopping you. I enjoy my workouts. I, I enjoy the camaraderie with all the fellows that work out there. And uh, in fact, we have parties together. So it, it's a wonderful place for me to go. Frank, such a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. You are an inspiration to me and to so many others.
Now, folks, if you are motivated to reach for the stars after hearing from Frank, we're just getting started. We'll be making a splash with two Olympic swimmers after this short break. American Graduate is proud to recognize a champion for education. Our mission is to provide girls and young women an opportunity for a better future through education, counseling, training, and advocacy to enable them to become independent, empowered young women and productive members of our society. I didn't want to graduate. I was going to drop out, and then I came to Pace. Frequent discipline problems, uh, family issues that cost them to not be able to attend school regularly, so they had big gaps in their learning. I didn't used to like coming to school, but once I started coming to Pace, it really brought me out to love school. A lot of times we might be that student's confidence until she begins to see her successes and see that she really can accomplish everything that she's come here to do. But education is more than just the academics. It's being able to function in society and be successful there. And we see that with our girls and we love it. Now I'm being a leader instead of a follower and I have people looking up to me to be the best person I can be. Pay Center for Girls is just a beautiful place to be because amazing things happen in the lives of the girls every day, and we're here to celebrate it. Pace Center for Girls in Pensacola, a positive environment to help young women grow, achieve, and succeed. For more stories of champions, visit americangraduate.org. Swimming is one of the most popular events during the summer games, and my next two guests took the plunge, returning home with Olympic medals. They competed decades apart, but soon became fast friends. We're excited to welcome Katie Ball Condon and Beth Barr to the show. Lovely ladies, we're all dressed in blue. We are. <laughs> Looking wonderful. <laughs> Katie, let's start with you. Now, I know that you were born in Jacksonville, right? Mm -hmm. Right. When did you move to the Pensacola area? Uh, after I got married, my husband okay. grew up here and he wanted to come back and settle down here. So that's what brought me here. So before the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, did you do most of your training in the Jacksonville area? Yeah, all of it there, yes. Mm -hmm. High school, did you have a personal trainer that assisted you before the Olympics? Well. Um, there was a group of swimmers, uh, there were about 10 of us, that some of the parents realized were exceptional. Okay. So our group of parents hired a coach, cool. and it was a group of about 10 or 12 of us, and we trained all year round. And um, so until I went to the Olympics, uh, that was our coach, and we had a couple of people from the team make the Olympic trials, I was the only one that made the games. Now I see you on the cover of Swimming World magazine, Breaststroke. Yeah. That was your forte, yeah, right? Absolutely. Breaststroke. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, training, a lot of people don't realize what it takes to prepare for the Olympics. I once heard Michael Phelps say that he had a 4,000 calorie per day diet. Does that sound normal? Well, I'm not surprised when you swim 15,000 meters a day and do weight training, <laughs> uh, four, you need 4,000 yes. calories to keep up. Now, let's talk about inspiration. 20 years apart competing in the Olympics, but Beth, mm -hmm. I know before you took the plunge, and we'll talk more about your journey a little bit later, but did Katie in any way inspire you along the way, hearing about her success. Oh, you know, I I learned about Katie, you know, after the Olympics, after I, w I was done. I think um, um, you moved here, 
1976, I think, 1976, we were here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's funny, you, you're sort of, um, when you're training, you're sort of in oblivion, yes. I think. You really are, and, and, and you, you learn about, um, you're in a little bubble when you're training. You know, I, I can't say this, training is a very selfish endeavor. It really is. Um, it is very self-consuming and you don't really notice all the other things. Um, we see you right around. here, Beth, oh, yes. in the pool there. But sacrifice, So right? I didn't notice anything going on. <laughs> but such an inspiration. Katie, back to you. Let's talk about sacrifice. Now, as a teenager growing up, the parties, the dances, the whole nine yards, were there many things that you had to give up to grasp this Olympic journey, this dreams. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we trained six days a week and um, twice a day. So mm -hmm. I never made a high school prom. I never went to a high school football game. I was swimming, but I loved it. It wasn't like I felt like I was giving something up, um, but I didn't have a normal high school life. So gold medal in the four by 100 meter medley Relay 1968. Let's get into your mind here for just a moment. Before you went to the pool for your race, we see your gold medal up here. So lovely. Thank you. Mental preparation, how important is that? Well, it's very important, but um, you know, like Beth, we had been swimming at a, a international level and it's just kind of expected. It's the next thing for an amateur athlete. That's all we've got is the Olympic Games. That's the pinnacle. So you're kind of prepared because you've been competing against the best in the world before that. Right. So it's just the next step. So once you are in the water, it's the, it's the race of all races per se, and you're in there. Is it a situation where you have a mental block and do you possibly not even remember what you did in the midst of the race? Uh, I, I remember, but again, I think the training comes in. You're so used to it. You've trained so much. You've swum so many tens of thousands of meters mm -hmm. that it's just, it's just what you do. Now, preceding the, the games, we know that you competed in the Olympic trials. Yeah. I know that we have several wonderful photos of you regarding your journey. Now, regarding the Olympic trials, we know that as far as the competition is concerned, sometimes athletes will try and psych another one out, right? And they'll try yeah. and say, oh, I won the last race. Do you think you can do better than me on, a, on any given day? But the main thing is focus and knowing that you're going to achieve your dreams no matter what. Yes. And we see you up here on the podium receiving yeah. your gold medal. Now, during the ceremony, a lot of people oftentimes cry. They shed a tear of joy and they think or have a flashback, as you will. Well, I can remember being on the podium and somebody putting a gold medal around your neck and the American flag going up and the national anthem and it's just... That's a very surreal moment. It's just like um, nothing I've ever experienced before or since. It's just, it's a great feeling. So let's talk about Mark Spitz for just a moment okay. here. He made a prediction for the 1968 games. He actually won two golds during 1968, but yeah. in 72, yeah. he won seven. So here you are on the cover of Swimming World <laughs> with Mark Spitz, was he a personal inspiration to you? Well, you know, not really. Uh, he did very well, but he was supposed to do in 68 what he did in 72. Right. So he was probably didn't have a very good Olympics and was disappointed. But a little he, disappointed. He certainly made up for it. <laughs> I could imagine yeah. that. Yeah. Switching gears, 1988 Seoul, South Korea. Beth, yes. you grew up in the Pensacola area. You trained at PJC Aquatics. We know that it has a new name now, but still, Pensacola girl mm -hmm. in high school, the journey. Let's talk about your road. I know your sweet mom, and I spoke with her on the telephone, such a beautiful lady. Mm -hmm. Your support system, can you talk about that? Oh, goodness. Well, I mean, when you're training, you know, as Katie knows, when you're training that young, uh, you know, she made the Olympics when she was 17. I made it when I was 16. You don't even get your driver's license. Yes. I mean, <laughs> your mom has to take you to practice. Um, so, I mean, at, you know, morning workout, having to get in the water at, you know, 5 a.m. and 
after school. I mean, you know, just the driving itself and making sure that you're eating nutritiously and making sure, you know, that um, you're getting to church and doing all of those things, making sure you're, you know, you, you got all your values right and you're doing all the right things. And um, I mean, you need that family support. Now, it's interesting that you also meddled in the four by 100 meter medley relay. Yes. Same event as Katie. Isn't that amazing? I wish I could have had her experience. Um, we had to swim against the East Germans, and um, so I'm, I'm very strong. Um, they were doing um, steroids. Okay. And I'm a very strong anti drug right, anti right. advocate, and um, it is, um, uh, I wish. Things may have been different. Yeah. Oh yes, I with wish I could have had her experience. Um, but, um, but yes, we had to swim against the East Germans. So right, but unfortunately, that did not happen. Yeah. I know you have a lot of great memories as high school females coming back. Yes. Now, Beth, there's a cute picture of you with a koala bear. <laughs> when you came back from the Olympic Games. And I said, that is so darling. Mm -hmm. Now, how was it coming back to Pensacola? Was there a lot of fanfare? Um, oh, yes. I mean, that, I think that was one of the really neat things. We had, let's see, um, one of the things that was really neat, we had, uh, we had six people from um, our team go to the Olympic trials. Three of us made the, um, made the Olympic team. Um, and uh, then we had so many people from Pensacola make the Olympics that year. So Pensacola was just all about the Olympics that year. So then we had parades and, you know, events, and it was just- Pep rallies, for pep example. Pep rallies, I mean, it was just amazing. It really, really and was. There you are, your pep rally there after you Hi. return, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. Now, the interesting thing about both of you, now, Katie, when you came back, there was a special article in the paper. We actually saw this little banner in the article, you coming back home and meeting yeah. up with your high school girlfriends. Now, 68. I know you're saying, what is next on the horizon for me? So let's talk about what you're doing right now. Well, right now, I'm basically just being a grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> That's I, fine. I was an interior decorator for about 10 years and um, decided to quit that. And I help out. I babysit and pick up my granddaughter from school a couple of days a week. So I'm just kind of got a laid back attitude there's going nothing, on. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with no, that. No. Actually, the two of you could pass for sisters. Let me shift back over <laughs> here to Beth for a moment. A little birdie told me that you're offering swimming lessons. Well, yes. I, I mean, I've had um, my company, Bear Coast Swimworks, for about seven years. I started it in Arizona. Um, I When I came back to Pensacola, I actually wanted to get involved with, with the, my old team, but um, the coach had told me that they wanted to cut their ties, wanted, wanted to cut ties with their, you know, their Olympic ties. So I said, okay, well, I'll just start my own thing. And so I've done that. And, um, you know, I started, uh, I was diagnosed with breast cancer last year. So you hear that. And, um, but I'm healthy now and I'm cancer free. So Wonderful I started, news. I offered my, started doing my swim lessons again this year. And I actually did swim lessons through chemo last year. So you are a trooper. Yeah. So I was, um, but that just kept me going. You know, I love my kids. And it is never too late to learn to swim. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I am yes, one of those people who needs to do that. <laughs> so if you ever had any words of encouragement briefly, Beth, to give to that youngster that's thinking about taking an Olympic journey, a few words of wisdom. It's just step by step. You just always keep, you do short term goals and long term goals. And you just always believe in yourself. I, you know, I know just like Katie, I mean, you, you just take it step by step. Don't ever let somebody tell you that you can't do something. Uh, and quickly, Katie, what about you? Just a few words of wisdom for our viewers. Well, you know, you've got to love what you do. If you don't love it, you can't be dedicated to it mm -hmm. and do what it takes to make it. So you gotta love what you do. You really do. Both of you are such inspirational women. Uh -huh. 
So glad yeah, to have both thanks. of you on the glad show. Glad to be here. I'm looking forward to interacting uh -huh. with both of you even more so in the future. I hope so. All right. Now, folks, it's time to lace up those running shoes for our next segment. If you love Olympic track and field events, you're in for a treat. Stay with us. We'll be back right after this. American Graduate is proud to recognize a champion for education. SkillsUSA is a national organization. It partners with business, industry, educators, and students because what we're trying to achieve is to have a skilled workforce. I'm going to school for heating and air conditioning with HVAC, which is where you learn how to work on air conditioners and refrigerators and walk-in coolers and anything to do with refrigeration. Skills USA promotes teamwork, leadership, citizenship, character development, and creates an environment that encourages students to complete their educations and plan a career path. Well, the most rewarding thing is to have students to be successful. Watching students start from um, in the beginning, coming here from either high school or another college, and uh, being successful within their program, finding that. Um, things were a little bit easier going through their program because they had Skills USA uh, to help them to be the best that they can be. So not only are you uh, becoming the best that you can be in your career field, but you're proving those skills in front of business and industry partners that are going to hire you for jobs in our future. Skills USA has helped me really step up my performance a lot more and be the best at my trade that I can be. Skills USA at Pensacola State College, helping students discover a world of possibilities. For more stories of champions, visit americangraduate.org. The last time you needed to know, there wasn't this or this. When the last hurricane hit our state, we were there. And today, we're still here. But we're also here. Introducing Florida Storms, a free mobile app from the Florida Public Radio Emergency Network, built just for Florida. With content from the National Hurricane Center and National Weather Service, Florida Storms will alert you to any weather hazard that may threaten you or your family. Florida Storms, download it today. His track and field journey started at Woodham High School in Pensacola, but for Justin Gatlin, that was just the tip of the iceberg. With numerous Olympic medals garnered already, he's a man on a mission to make an impacting difference on and off the track. The Summer Games in Rio de Janeiro are approaching, and he's preparing for several events. Tonight, I'm honored to have Jeanette and Willie Gatlin, Justin Gatlin's parents, on the show. Now, during this segment, We'll focus on Justin's childhood through college years. Jeanette, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Proud mom. I can see it all over your face. You are so proud of your son. I see almost a tear coming <laughs> welling up in your eyes. Let's take it back from the cradle. You and I were joking a few days ago, from the cradle to Rio, right? Yes, ma'am. So we're starting with the cradle, <laughs> the early days. Now, there was always something special about Justin as a child, right? Yes, there was. Uh, Justin seemed to have been fearless. Justin was running and jumping over fire hydrants at four <laughs> years old. And um, he was just you, unstoppable. You just could not stop him. He was just doing everything he thought he was big enough to do. And I will tell you this, at around 11 months, he was even dressed in USA team gear. That's a beautiful family portrait under a year of age. And look at that, that's what I was just referencing. How would you know almost a foreboding of things to come? I had no clue. <laughs> <laughs> but my, none. None. But my husband, uh, Justin was very active through the pregnancy, so my husband said that I was mocking him because I used to say he's running track in my stomach. I wish he'd stop. <laughs> and I never heard the expression of mocking him. Yes. And um, lo and behold, I guess I mocked him. <laughs> so, Willie, running track. Now, you're an Army, Army vet. Right. I'm a Navy brat myself. We oh, love our armed forces, right, don't right, we? we do. So, running track in her stomach. That's amazing. Now, as a proud papa, were you into a lot of physical sports? Did you love recreation a lot? 
I played a lot of tennis in a high lot school. A lot of tennis in high school. Right. Mm -hmm. And did the military physics. That's about it. Yeah. Now, we also know that Justin loved his martial arts, among other things, growing up over the years, martial arts, but such a multifaceted youngster, because in addition to that, and we see him looking amazing right there, <laughs> quite artistic with the paintbrush too, in middle and high school, all the different talents that he had. So it's just amazing the gifts that were given Yes. As yes. humans, right? Yes. Right. We don't all have the same gifts, and rightly so. We would not want to be clones in that respect. But when it came to Justin, was there an early spark, Jeanette, that let you know that, hey, my son could have a future in track and field? So take me back. Take me back to when Justin was first introduced to track and field. Well, Justin actually uh, was on the track at Washington High School. Okay. He went to two years at Washington, Washington, two years at Woodham. And he was on the track at Washington High School and just horsing around. He was not on the team. And their track coach saw him and thought that, wow, this kid has some talent. talent. And actually, Justin was a hurdler. He was not a sprinter. Most people don't know that or remember Interesting that. Interesting factoid. Yeah, but he was a hurdler, and um, he suggested that he go to Woodham High School because they had a great group of coaches to okay. help him. And so, therefore, we transferred him to Woodham, and he hurdled his way to <laughs> a, uh, um, scholarship, a, scholarship? a scholarship to the University of Tennessee. And his high school coach would not let him sprint except for the uh, the um, state championship. State, state championship. championships. State championships. He let him right, because right, he had to do five events. Willie, who was his coach? Who was his high school coach? Jay Cormier. Okay, right. tell us a little bit about the man that helped mold Justin's career early on. Coach Cormier, he he, he pursued Justin uh, to come to with him. Uh, he would call my house and ask oh, me. Oh, he called you? He would call, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't answer the phone. So I, I happened to be home one day by myself, and the phone rang, and it was Coach called me on the phone and says, I said, Mr. Gallup, now, you know, you've been dodging me, but I, I want to tell you, your son has a lot of talent, a lot of fine, raw talent. If you let him come to work, we'll mold him shaping. Okay, I can't promise you uh, a scholarship, but I'll tell you, he'll get a lot of go-sees, and uh, you just need to let him come and let me work with him. So we transferred to, to Woodham. And this is a special dedication at Woodham High School. We know that so many accolades Justin received while there. Justin Juice Gatlin, that back in 2005, and rightly so. I was told by Jeanette <laughs> that as a child <laughs> that Justin was asked to go outside and take a picture. <laughs> you may laugh, Willie, <laughs> that his dad told him to go outside and take a picture with his medals from high school adorned on his arms, around his neck, he wasn't smiling. Now that does speak volumes to me, because here we are, there it is right up there. So humility, and I haven't met Justin, but I just have a feeling. Talk Just, about humility for a moment there. Justin felt that was showing off. Okay. He wasn't interested in doing that. Um, <laughs> he, he, he just was not. And, of course, we as his parents wanted pictures, you know. And um, Justin hasn't changed a whole lot. I mean, it's hard for him to. He's just begun to display all of his awards and medals that he has uh, one in his okay. house. In his house. In his house. In um, Orlando? In Orlando, Orlando. In his okay. house in Orlando. Um, he doesn't like us to show the room in our house. <laughs> so he's kind of laid back, easy going, and he says he's just, that's what he does. So it's okay. It's cool. Another great photo from high school. That level of humidity, humility rather, and also knowing that that humble nature is to be treasured because when we walk away into another direction a lot of times and sometimes people do get a big head things can really go wrong that is very true that is very true and I'm happy to say that Justin does not have a big head um, 
some of his high school friends and family here in town, when he comes home, they seem to put him up on a pedestal. You know, they'll say, like one night they were all going to the movies and I said, okay, take the garbage out, Justin, when you leave. And they were like, oh my God, you want him to take the garbage out? And I said, yeah. And if no you big don't, eyes, no little no. use. If we you can all do the same. Exactly. Yeah, right. if, if they didn't want him to take it out, then they had to take it out. But the garbage <laughs> had to go. <laughs> it has to go either way. Willie, let's talk about Justin's years shifting over to the University of Tennessee. Great high school career. Now that road is leading him to the University of Tennessee. Now, was he a hurdler and sprinter at UT, or did he concentrate more on sprinting? He, he was a hurdler. Okay. He was a hurdle. Uh, the head coach uh, decided to give him a chance to sprint because they had a number one sprinter there, and Justin said he felt like an amateur in his shadows. But he uh, was given the chance to, to sprint, uh, and uh, he started sprinting. And he looks happy, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. <laughs> Especially adorned on East Side by mom and dad, who right. wouldn't? <laughs> so the accolades that he received while at UT, and I know, Jeanette, you said Justin doesn't like it when his medals are shown, but we reviewed a few pictures. This is just one of them. This is the UT room that you have at your house, right? Yes. Right. And Wheaties boxes, the one on the left from the Olymp rather the one on the left and the one on the right, both look like they're from the Olympics. Well, the one on the left is in the blue. Okay. Is the Olympic Weedy box. Okay. The one, the other one, is a dummy Weedy box. A dummy Weedy box that his dad and I made up for him. Really? When he was in <laughs> high school. <laughs> So you had big dreams back then. We were just horsing around. We didn't even really give it a lot of thought. It looks authentic. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> Justin came back to Woodham High School for maybe one or two appearances, right? And we know that his jersey at Woodham was retired, number 15. Yes. Right. So yes. that must have been quite an emotional time for Justin. It was. I know that you were there. Yes. Very what much. was going through your mind, Willie, at that moment? I uh, was very proud, very proud for him to come back to Woodham. Uh, and all his students still loved him at Woodham. And they uh, really appreciated him coming back, giving him his point of view about success and their future. And uh, he, he, he liked to come back. And the Pensacola Sports Association Banquet. Now, this happened after he was at the University of Tennessee. So, Pensacolians remembering him also. And I think also encouraging him even more. So, look at that photo right up there. Amazing. That's him and Jay Cormier, his high school coach, and the award. Justin is one to always say, if I can do it, you can do it. And he enjoys going out, speaking to children, different schools and, and organizations where their youth involved. And he, he encourages them because, like he says, if I can do it, you can do it. Right. It just takes a lot of hard work and focus, determination. And Willie, that definitely speaks volumes because there are some people who do not like to get out in front of an audience and convey those words, but it's about giving back. Isn't it? Exactly. Exactly. It is. Exactly. Uh, if, if, you know, each one teach one. So if I you like have that. something you can depart, then do so. Uh, encourage the ones behind you to come on up, you know, to your level. He has not forgotten his roots at <laughs> all. Yes. At all. So for all the youngsters out there that are watching Justin's career, and especially those in middle and high school right now, those are great things to think about. Now, as far as maybe encouraging somebody to pursue that track scholarship, there are some things that sometimes we have to give up in life, right? Yes. Maybe extracurricular activities. Yes, but, but that is an extracurricular activity. And Such it, as the movies and things of that exactly, nature. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But he, you know, I mean, as one of your uh, Previous guests said, if you don't love it, then you can't get it done. All right, we'll pick up 
after that in just a moment. So folks, let's keep the momentum flowing. We'll explore Justin Gatlin's Olympic journey and much more right after this break. back to continue the conversation with Jeanette and Will and Gatlin. It's time to shift gears as we focus now on Justin's professional career. All right, Jeanette, as you and I were sifting through pictures about a week ago, beginning the professional career, let's talk about the Moscow Challenge that Justin participated in. Uh, Moscow Challenge was a race that, um, I guess, an all-comers yes. race. Yes. And whoever was able to win this race would receive a very large crown, uh, a very <laughs> large crown, crown a brocade <laughs> cape, as well as a big check. And um, it was the end of the season that year, which was his first year. Yes. And he um, he said, "I don't have anything to lose. I can go." And he went. He ran, and he won. That is awesome. So there's a little bit of a gap. So we're wondering, all right, from the Moscow Challenge to the U.S. Olympic team, will he help us out here? So let's talk about the next steps in Justin's life leading up to that point. He came back really uh, inspired and really dedicated. Uh, he, he felt that there uh, was a higher plateau he could achieve, too. So he, he really sacrificed uh, and did track. I mean, he's slept track, ate track, he did, that's all he did, track. I mean, walking through the malls on days off, he'd be doing his moves for track. He just, like I said, he ate, slept track, you know, to get himself ready uh, for, for, for the next plateau. So was he actually doing that here in Pensacola mm -hmm. or elsewhere? He was doing that everywhere he went. Everywhere he everywhere was. He <laughs> if he, he was home in Pensacola, right. he was doing it. And <laughs> okay. If right. He was, wherever he was training at the time, he was doing it. It, it, was, it was a lifestyle for him. Mm -hmm. it was, and it still is. So who noticed him regarding the U.S. Olympic team? How did he become a part of the U.S. Olympic team before the 2004 Olympics? Well, the Olympics have a trial period. Right. And basically, all of the American athletes, USA track and field athletes, are able to go to the trials and participate. They run several rounds, and they're eliminated yes. through the rounds. And uh, Justin ran all the rounds in the 100 and the 200, okay. and he made the team. Good. He made the team. And he was the youngest on the team in 2004. Right. Um, with God's blessings, he's probably going to be the oldest on the team. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. So 2004 in Athens. I know that was an exciting time yes. for you. Very Willie, yes. the, you and Jeanette went. Yes. So what kind of experience was that for you as parents? It was awesome. I mean, it just it, in the stand. I mean, 100,000 people in the stand. Uh, we was filming with the camera trying to take pictures and uh, the camera <laughs> beamed in on and said, look, they don't even know how to do, work the camera. And, you know, we were so excited. Uh, it just, how long yeah. before the Olympic Games started were you in Athens? Maybe just a few days preceding the Games? 
Did you yes. arrive a little early? Yes, we arrived okay. a couple of days early uh, to get acclimated to the subway system and how to get to the track, to the stadium. All right. Now, we know that Justin won the gold medal, 100 meters, <laughs> 2004. In the stands, in your mind at that particular moment, Mom, what were you thinking? Now, we see Justin here greeting fans after the race, but what were you thinking, Jeanette? I was just thinking and saying, thank you, Jesus. I was just yes. so, so happy for the blessings. Right. And it is a blessing. It really is. It's a blessing, and I was just as I still do now. I say, thank you, Jesus. And here he is giving his thanks on the track after winning that race. Yes, exactly, exactly. You know, we know where the blessings come from and we're thankful for them. Right, and he won several medals during the 2004 games as well, but of course he's no more so for that Olympic gold medal. And the fact that he has remained humble the entire time. He, he is the type of person that, even as a young child, if you visit our home and Justin was home, you didn't even know he was there. Most of the time, he was always in his room, watching TV, eating grapes, <laughs> and... Um, Minding his own business. Yeah, yeah. You know, you would say to him, well, so-and-so is here, come out and speak. And he would do so and right back in his room. Now... We know that you were interviewed by Katie Couric in 2004 during the Olympic, well, really after Justin won. And when he came back to Pensacola, can you describe what happened at that time? There's Katie up there on the screen with all of you. He came back to Pensacola, Florida, Olympic champion. We know that there were feature articles printed, but he still definitely maintained that level of humility. Yes, Justin, um, actually they had a big fanfare down at um, the C Civic Center at that time, that's what it was called. And um, they rode him in on, in a convertible. Uh, it was free, anybody that yes. wanted to come, the center was full. In actuality, um, he sat there and he signed autographs for whoever that wanted one and the line was three hours. That's amazing. Yes. Now, has Justin ever faced any challenges on and off the track? Anything that has been a challenge to him in his life? I think that you don't live without challenges. And um, yes, he, he, he did face some challenges, a lot of negativity. Right. And the only thing I can say about that is that once people that were so negative actually checked their facts, knew the story okay. and what had happened, it's been a complete 360 okay. degree turnaround. So, um, but I have to say that the people that knew him, the people that supported him, the people that believed in him, that never wavered, never wavered. And um, even some of the official track uh, meets yes. that were little skeptical, little negative okay. or whatever, uh, they have done a 360. They are emailing, they are calling his agent, they are pursuing him and wanting him to come and participate. All right. Now we have an awesome picture right here of Justin midair, <laughs> so mid -air. to speak, right? So let's shift on over to 2012, the London Games. Would you say Usain Bolt from Jamaica is a rival of Justin's, or maybe are they friends? Willie, would you like to answer that? They're rivals on the okay, track. Okay, on the track. On the track, but they are, they're friends off the track, Justin and Usain. They, they speak and they're cordial to each other, and I've heard both say Justin could be one of his best friends off the track, you know, but when they get on the track, they're definitely rivals, yeah. So we'll see what happens. We know that Justin won the bronze in the 100 meters back in 2012, but hey, since then he has beaten Usain, yes. right? Yes. yes. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how things shape up in Rio de Janeiro, right? Yes. Correct. Now recently, Sacred Heart Hospital dedicated a special room on April 1st to Justin. Right. Willie, let's talk about that. And there you all are in that room. <laughs> Describe it for us, please. What happened? 
It's awesome. It was, it, it was an awesome moment uh, to, to go and uh, to have him uh, on it in that way uh, in the sports medicine. Uh, we, we truly enjoyed being there. Uh, we took a lot of pictures and we sent it to him and he couldn't be there so we represented him and a lot of the artifacts was there uh, and we truly enjoyed I, th I think it's a, a good thing uh, to have there for the, the patients, other, right. other athletes come in and uh, they can talk about the, whatever room they're in because it's not only it's basketball, it's football rooms. Yeah. In, Various yeah. sports right. and we would like to thank Sacred Heart for providing right. us with those pictures right. for this show. Now, we know that Jason, Justin rather, also knows a lot of famous celebrities. One is Emmett Smith. How long have they known each other? Uh, I think Justin and Emmett met uh, when they first had the first Pensacola Sports Association banquet, probably that Justin attended back in maybe 2001, 2002. Mm -hmm. And Roy Jones Jr., famous boxer as well? Uh, Justin has known Roy probably a little longer. Um, I think he met Roy during high school, right. and Roy has been very supportive. Roy has called the house and really, you know, wanted to pass on his well wishes Justin to him. Justin has stuff. a lot of friends. Yes. Speaking of which, preceding Rio, and we have just a moment or two left in the show, what is Justin doing right now in preparation for Rio? What is next for him, Willie? He's training. He's training very hard. As, as a matter of fact, as we speak, he's... Uh, on his way to Eugene, Oregon, uh, he has a race this Saturday coming at the Prefontaine Classic. That's to help get him in shape for the Olympic trials, which proceeds uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro for the Olympic Games. So he's training. Jeanette, when will the Olympic trials be held and where? The Olympic trials will be held in Eugene, Oregon, and uh, it's June 30th to July 11th. I believe are the dates. Um, at least those are the dates we're traveling. And uh, we try to get there a day before or so and then uh, leave the day after, you know, with the airport not being so crazy. Yes. So we know from June 30th to July 11th um, in Eugene, Oregon, will be the Olympic trials. So any specific words to our viewers who are rooting for Justin in TV land? Anything that you would like to tell those that are wishing him well? Um, I say you can't get too many prayers and too much mother love. So <laughs> yes. those that tell me, oh, that's my boy, yes. that's your boy, it's okay with me. <laughs> and praying, you know, when we all pray for the same thing, miracles happen. They definitely they can. Yes, they Willie, what about you? Are you echoing those words? I'm echoing the same sentiments to all the fans out there, the well wishes to say, good positive things and we'll put it in the ether and let it become reality. So great to have both of you, Justin's you. parents, thank on the you. show. Thank it's been marvelous. Yes. Again, we want to thank all of our guests for joining us this evening. Thanks for watching, viewers. I'm Ramika Vincent Leary. Have a good evening and remember to keep it locked in right here on WSRE PBS for the Gulf Coast.